I'm Sun Young Shin. I'm a local author and poet. I grew up in a suburb of Chicago called Brookfield. It's on the southwest side. I'm the editor at the Twin Cities Daily Planet, which is an online newspaper. And our mission is to amplify and connect marginalized voices. So it's kind of a dream job in that it's with language. I work with other writers. It's all about what kinds of stories does our community need that aren't being told. So it meshes really well with my, my mission as a poet and as an artist. I went to college at Boston University to study English. And then my boyfriend wanted to go to McAllister College specifically to study linguistics. And I did not even really know where Minnesota was. But I said, yes, that seems like a great idea. So I ended up in St. Paul, Minnesota and finished my bachelor's at Mac. I think the most Minnesotan thing about me is probably that I'm an idealist and a dreamer and I, I think that all things are possible um, and that community is really important to me in a way that I maybe wouldn't have foreseen before moving here. I really love language. I think I've just always been obsessed with language uh, as a reader. My main form of work I would say is poetry and then everything else kind of radiates out from there as different, almost different forms of poetry. I think of them even though they do fall into other genres. I was doing my graduate degree for teaching actually and one of the things we were learning about was how to teach literature and creative writing to adolescents and I had a wonderful professor named John Fenn who's a local playwright and he gave us some writing assignments where we could either develop some curriculum um, or we could try some curriculum and then reflect on it. So one of the assignments was to write a poem and I just kind of out of the blue tried it and I really liked it and he was really encouraging and so from there I just it, that kind of gave me permission to really explore it as a as a genre. Favorite things about the poetry community are definitely that poetry is taken seriously um, not too seriously I think but that it's integrated into a lot of public and community events that poets are not seen as outside or out, outliers, that they're seen as people who can contribute to celebrations and to our sense of who we are as a community. Um, and that also uh, for artists of color, I think because we've been in really a small, small numerically, that we've built a really supportive community over the years or over the years that I've been here. One of my books that came out in 2016 was a Good Time for the Truth, Race in Minnesota with the Minnesota Historical Society Press. And that was a real opportunity for me to take a lot of work that I and others have been doing for years or for decades around racial justice and around storytelling and around the language we use around what is art and what is writing for and who, who do writers look like, to put that together into one project. And so that's work that I'm continuing to do in various ways of trying to be a part of dismantling white supremacy in our literary community as well as just generally in the state and um, in this country in terms of how not just writers of color and indigenous writers but um, historically marginalized communities have been struggling to be, to be heard and to have their perspectives um, centered. It's just exceeded our wildest dreams in terms of um, not just book sales, but in terms of the reception. Yeah, all across the state, we've been invited to speak at all kinds of colleges and universities and high schools and churches and community groups and librarians and teachers. And um, people have been really, the people we've met with have been really hungry to have these frank discussions where we can talk about race where it's okay to disagree, where it's okay to start from where you are, and it's okay to, to start thinking about solutions and getting beyond just our political climate and increased attacks on people of color, on Muslims, on queer folks, on immigrants. Um, it's really, people feel a renewed urgency in terms of caring for each other and how are we gonna move forward, what kind of community slash nation do we really want to be. So 
That's something that um, I've been so gratified by that project. I wasn't sure how it would be received, but people have really stepped up, so it's been great. It has been a great reception. People have been really interested in what we have to say, I think because Minnesota has been a very segregated state and our communities are still very segregated that our white readers have been often very surprised and they'll say, I, I didn't know. I think because it's not safe for many writers of color, people of color to talk at their workplaces because we're often so isolated. So the book has been a way for people to take the stories and sit with them and really absorb them at their own pace. And so I think that's what's been really good about the anthology and that also it's, it's 16 different indigenous writers and writers of color. So it's not just looking at one racial group, um, but it's looking at the complex dynamics of just race in general and in specifically how it's lived in the state. Um, so it's been selling really well. We're still doing a lot of events and we're having great conversations and I think we're really challenging people to move past just talking. Unbearable Splendor started as my exploration into epics and I was really thinking about is there a feminine epic? Could I take something like the Odyssey, which is a masculine epic, which has female characters, but it's really the soldiers, former soldiers arc of trying to return home. I started working with the text and seeing if I could rewrite it in my own kind of verse. And once I started reading it, I realized it was really about hospitality. It was really about the politics of hospitality and that became more interesting to me than the actual form of the epic and what it could or couldn't do. I'm still interested in that, but I just wasn't kind of getting it at the moment. It became about um, really definition of who is a stranger in society, how are foreigners constructed and defined, who gets hospitality and who doesn't. And that theme really picked up a lot of just enduring interests that I have in terms of foreignness, migration, uh, assimilation, different ways that we have our identities interrogated to see whether we're a threat or not. Um, so that's what that book became about and I just, like on a concrete level was exploring the idea of hospitality through mostly different kinds of monsters um, and different kinds of figures like the cyborg. So Blade Runner is a kind of big presence in the book even though there's not really cyborgs they're just completely artificial beings, but the idea of how we look at robots to see what are the limits of human affection, how can we, how much can our ways of being actually be programmed, I think is what robots ask us to look at. So robots and the Minotaur and other kinds of foreigners within society, and then how each of those stories is kind of like a test case for what is the society's tolerance for the strange or strangers. So thinking about our you know, current migrant crisis on the planet, my own immigration, um, and just ways that many of us in, specifically in US society, are considered foreign and or undigestible in some way into the American story. I am a big fan of Milkweed Books, which is on Washington Avenue in Minneapolis. It's open seven days a week from Monday to Saturday from 10 to 7 and Sunday from 11 to 3. They actually have an amazing selection that is just carefully curated by book lovers um, for everyone, not just one particular type of reader. And it's a project that has been created with a lot of love for books and readers and so I'm happy to always come to this store and read old things there's most of them are still around for good reason read outside your even what you think you're interested in and then don't be afraid to be really weird just really examine try not to you know grind down those rough edges that maybe other people think are too non-understandable, but I think writers and artists, um, now especially maybe, should really be pushing the envelope and just experimenting.